our hosts, the world-renowned Christine Enville, an IFBB professional, three times world champion, a mentor, an icon, and of course, a founding co-owner of the best supplements money can buy, International Protein. In this podcast, we dig deep into nutrition and we find out which proteins to use and when, which meals are the most important, the best nutritional tactics for recovery, how to eat on rest days, and Christine's thoughts on fasting. Christine, it's been bugging me. Which is it? Do we take our protein 30 minutes before the workout or 30 minutes afterwards? And what's the difference? Okay, you can actually do both. Although 30 minutes before is probably a little too soon, to be quite honest. Um, Where do I start? Okay. So the pre-workout meal to me is the most important meal for training. And to me, it's actually more important than the post-workout. So we put a lot of emphasis on the post-workout meal because that's about recovery and replenishing what you've used and all that kind of stuff. But research that was done um, by a company called um, Murray Goldman when they were making um, whey proteins in Australia, they put a lot of money and a lot of time into research around protein. And they discovered that you actually start recovering as soon as you're done your first exercise, basically. So what they f- figured out that was what you were eating before your your workout was actually as important as what you were eating after your workout. So in my mind, you, you have to eat something before your workout and you have to eat something after you work out. So you can do both, um, but 30 minutes is probably not enough time for the type of protein that I would recommend that you have pre-workout. So there's a massive difference in what you would have before you work out and what you would have after you work out in, time, in terms of the timing of the release of the proteins. So let's start with the easy one, the post-workout. Everyone knows about WPI, whey protein isolate. Yep. Everyone knows that it's very rapidly absorbed and that's probably the protein that most people know to go to straight after training. So if people are taking one protein to recover, they're normally doing a post-workout shake and they're normally taking a whey protein isolate. So that's relatively simple and that's the right thing to do. You want that quicker hit of protein straight after your workout or within 30 minutes of your workout. So can um, I stop you there just for a yeah, second? Yeah, sure. Within 30 minutes, so is it, you know, like you just worked out, can you leave it for 29 minutes, uh, you know, sort of get results out of that after burn before you hit the protein or, or like is there any yeah. sort of science there, around that? Yeah, there's actually a two-hour window of what they call window of opportunity after you work out. So it kind of ticks like a clock where it becomes less effective as that time period moves on. So obviously when you finished working out, your insulin's high and it's so that means it's your body's in a, what it wants to store. It wants to take things, it wants to replenish and it wants to store. So post-workout, the closer to when you've worked out, the higher that is and the more benefit you're going to get, the more it's going to take in. So if you, so for example, if you took in 100 gram, grams of say carbs and protein after your workout, your body's more able to deal with that, to, to put it into use, to, to recover with it at time zero as what it is at the two hour mark. So as the time goes on, then it kind of becomes less receptive. So you maybe it can kind of tolerate having a lesser amount without storing it as body fat is essentially what I'm saying. So it's not a matter of, okay, I have it at 29 minutes and then at 30, it's ineffective. It's just over that time period. So literally um, a lot of people would have it, you know, have a shaker with them and have it at the gym and do it straight away. And that's where something like our amino recovery comes in because gives you enough of a protein hit it's not really enough of a calorie hit to really impact on your meals like it is still very much a supplement but it's giving you that very instantly absorbed like have that either you know right at the end of your workout some people have it during the workout but that kind of gets you that initial part of that recovery and takes advantage of that very immediate post-workout um, situation but as i said you're actually recovering from that first set so it's not like your body gets to the end of the workout and goes oh, now i'm going to start to recover like literally whatever's in your system, it's using some of the um, amino acids for energy, but it's also whatever's in there it can start to use for repair. So it's two things are happening simultaneously and that's what this research showed. So bringing it back to um, like my experience over the years, because of being you know female, we're limited in you know how many calories we can take in a lot of the time compared to a lot of the male competitors. So I actually didn't have a lot of the times a traditional post-workout meal like within that 30 minutes mine was kind of more in that within that two hour period um and i but i always made sure that within an hour before i had a longer a slower release protein so 
not that we had it at the time, um, but I always took in like caseins and as, as well as whey protein. So that would be our synergy product. I would have that about an hour before my um, my training session, 45 minutes to an hour. And that's a much slower to break down product. So now like looking back in hindsight, I realized that that was actually doing a lot of that recovery process because that carried me through the workout past that time and then to the time when I was able to eat my meal um, you know, within that two hour time frame. So I was kind of at the, at the late end of the two hour and it didn't seem to impede my recovery and my muscle retention coming into a competition. So that's, you know, that was my saving grace because I always did wonder that. How come I'm not I'm not having a post-workout shake and I'm not dying here, I'm not, not recovering? Um, so that's two ways of looking at it. You do need to eat before you train. So it would make sense to me that you would have a mixture of protein and carbs. So pick a protein, which is a slower release protein. Don't have a WPI an hour before you work out like that's not a good idea it's it's too quick um it's got to be basically taken care of and taken out of your bloodstream and not available for use when it's needed to be there or your body's like your body will then go and release protein from your own muscle to feed what it needs it won't use what's because you don't have anything floating around in your blood whereas if you take a slower release protein the pro the, the protein amino acids from the protein will be floating around in your blood available for your body to use so that's why that type. And then post-workout, you, you flip over and you have that quickly absorbed one. So again, amino recovery is great because you can have that during the workout as well. It's, it's what we now call hydrolyzed protein. So it's a very, very um, small chains of amino acids which get absorbed better than even a free form amino acid. And it doesn't divert the blood away from your muscle into your stomach to need digestion. It literally crosses over and crosses into the crosses over the the um, what they call it the the intestinal barrier. The you know basically what lets your body absorb food. I forget the name of it right at the moment, but it lets you absorb instantly without having to break anything down. So the blood stays in the muscle. You don't get a stitch, uh, and it's it is there for instant use to sort of just assist that recovery. And I know um, our, our sponsored athlete, Brandon Ray, is a very big fellow, and he'll actually make sure he drinks that during his workouts, particularly on back and leg days where he's, you know, he's hitting up pretty hard and doing some, you know, some very, very heavy sets. And he says, like, he'll actually top up, refill his bottle and have another serve of amino recovery. And he said he actually feels the difference in his just ability to keep on training if he doesn't have that. So that's someone who's, I guess, stressing their body to the extreme. Um, but for just the person who's wanting to do a, a good workout, um, have both, like have a have a meal, but not half an hour before, have it more like the hour before, because you do need something um, which I believe is gonna stay in your system a little bit longer and not, you know, not so close. You're gonna potentially um, feel uncomfortable when training because I would have that with other food. I would have it with some fruit or something like that. And then post-workout have, you know, have either the amino recovery straight away. And then as long as you're having a meal within that two hour period, or, you know, people will have their, their protein shake straight after a lot of people take it to the gym or have it in the car on the way home. And then they'll go and, you know, follow that up with an, an actual meal, um, like within a couple of hours. And again, sort of bringing it back to what most people I know in you know bodybuilding also do like say they're leaving the gym might take them half an hour to drive home so they'll make up their shake have their shake and then when they get home then they'll prepare dinner or you know have a you know clean up after gym and, and it's not that you know at the moment um, obviously with travel times taken out of it so it's a lot easier for people to do um, in this instance but normally in that normal routine where you have to then travel home um, that's basically tidying you over until you then have an actual proper meal but yeah you can do both Right, so that yep. um, pre-slow release protein, the pre uh, the pre workout protein. Yeah. Um, although we're not, you know, trying to push international protein yeah. in a massive way here, which of which uh, protein within your range is the ideal protein for that scenario? The the protein synergy. The synergy. Yeah, the synergy because yeah. that, like, to me, that has a, like a really good range of amino acids. So. We don't have it up on the wall. It's, it's our it's our original product. Um, it's the one which is a blend of the six different types of protein. So it's got some very rapidly releasing ones, and then some much slower releasing ones. And I, as I said, I've always used that one, or if not that one, before we had the company, I always worked on that principle of having a blend of different proteins in my um, my pre workout protein meal. And like I say, I find that that eating chicken or steak or anything else like salt like call like solid food within an hour before i train it just never worked for me i really like something light really in my stomach yeah. yeah yeah and it also can be inconvenient because you might have to actually sit and and, and have a, a, a place to eat it and a lot of the time you don't have that luxury you know you need to have something you can kind of 
eat out of a little bowl somewhere or, um, you know, heaven forbid, drive and eat or anything like that. But yeah, it, it, it's it's a lot less obvious than having to sit down and like chop up chicken and, and you know, have that smell go everywhere and have your workmates complain and, and everything. So that's part of it. But yeah, the main part is it just doesn't, doesn't sort of digest well and then go off and have a training session. It just feels kind of wrong. It feels too heavy. So post-workout, you have uh, protein within 30 minutes. Yeah. That'll tie you off until you get home and cook dinner. Well, is it actually better if you have something like an apple or something like that, some some form of food uh, straight after your workout as well? Um, or would you say it, that protein does it all? No, well, again, this depends on where you're at, what you're trying to do. If you're just trying to be um, fit, healthy, or stronger, I would suggest then having some carbs with it as well. Now, whether that be in the form of a fruit, whether it be in the, like some of the gyms nowadays have bar, like a, a, a smoothie bar, uh, whether you have fruit and protein and all blended up together and they can make that for you, whether you eat an apple, because you know, apple's easy to eat, I call it portable fruit. Um, you know, something like that you have to, a banana, an apple, something that's really, really easy to eat. Um, they're really good things or, and again, you know, we're not here to push international protein, but obviously the extreme carbs is a carb supplement that's designed to go hand in hand and it's designed for either it's for energy pre-workout as well as post-workout recovery so if people just want to put everything in one shake that's you know that's an option it's very easy to dose that out and it's very easy to get exactly what you want um but certainly the the combination for recovery isn't just about protein it's about carbs and protein and definitely when you've done a, a heavy workout you want to replenish that glycogen so um, you, you combine, a, I guess, a fruit, which is a simple sugar, with your protein, it actually increases the amount of protein that you can absorb. Okay. Yeah, they work synergistically. So you want to get a better a better uptake and a better absorption when you're having the protein with some more simple form of carbohydrate in that post-workout window that we talked about. So in that, you know, one to, sorry, the zero to two hour period. Uh, and then after that, your body kind of reverts back and it's more it's like, nah, I just want to store this all as body fat, so don't give it to me. That's... Yeah, that's how it works. So what happens if you if you don't have any kind of supplements after your workout? Yeah. Explain what the body does. Okay, the, well, the body still tries to recover. Okay, so it looks for, you know, what has it got? Where, you know, what, what can I do? And if it's not there, it just doesn't do it. So essentially what that does, it impacts your next day's workout. So eventually you will eat breakfast and you will put some carbohydrates back in. But the amount that you're recovering, so the amount of glycogen that you're re-retaining is is lower the amount like you're not going to set off that recovery cascade which builds your muscle so essentially you want to start to break your muscle down and get into what we call a, a pattern of overtraining and you, and me personally i feel it like you feel more tired your body feels physically more run down and if you do that for too long a period of time like once you do it you know you'll, you'll get over it your body will recover eventually it just takes a little bit longer but if you do that on a repeated cycle over and over again you'll you are going to end up losing size losing strength potentially getting sick because it's just it's stressing your body too much not giving it what it needs to recover so your body ultimately always does try to find an equilibrium it just it's not as not as efficient at doing it and you may be running at such a level that you're never completely recovering what you need in terms of your your glycogen and you're certainly going to be breaking your muscle down and not putting what you need into then start that recovery you're definitely not going to be growing muscle like you're essentially going to be training to break it down and that could be a reason why a lot of people don't get the results that they see in the gym because it, it's like you um if you don't back it up with your nutrition all of that work can actually be like detrimental to what you're doing so do you, do you see that um, a lot of people just actually don't eat enough yes i can see a lot of people that don't change or yeah. don't you know you're going to the gym if you're not getting some kind of improvement, even if, like some people are not going to be predisposed to grow really, really huge, but they're still going to, muscles going to feel harder. They're going to get more definition or they're going to get stronger. Like there's those people who have genetic um, predisposition to get stronger without the size coming along with it. But you you wouldn't expect that you want to go to the gym and work hard and see like absolutely no change. Like that tells me that something's not right. If something's wrong in the equation that you should should be noticing something. Like even if it's very, very slight, you should be noticing something. So yeah, there's probably a lot of people who are doing this part of the work and then just not supporting it with the nutrition. So you end up in kind of that status quo or even, you know, the the, the worst case scenario, which is where you're, you, know, you are breaking your body down and you see people kind of, um, I guess, looking more sickly, not looking as healthy as what they should. And um, maybe, you know, it shows up as injuries and, um, 
you know, getting sick and getting injured and stuff like that. So, yeah, it is entirely possible to, to really underestimate the, um, you know, the needs that you have nutritionally and, um, you know, the timing of your food and, and what you eat is very important. Your body will always do what it can to kind of, like, survive. Like, it'll always try to, to take whenever the opportunity comes up and, and take that food. Um, but you definitely are going to feel it in your performance as well. And that, again, could be why people say they're not feeling stronger in the gym, they're just feeling more tired from the gym and all that kind of stuff, and you shouldn't. Like, the gym, to me, um, whilst helps you sleep better because you're kind of, like, working out and making yourself tired, it overall in your daily life should make you more energetic and give you more of an ability to tackle things and deal with things that come up throughout the day. So mm-hmm. definitely if you're um, doing doing the work but not then repairing and recovering, and feeding your body, then you're gonna, you are gonna notice that in a, in a negative way. Mm. So nutrition, you know, if we were to put that as a percentage of the overall result that we're trying to get, like uh, it's pretty heavy and as a percentage, isn't it? It's it, pretty important. It makes it's the difference between the result, I believe. Like, and I'll give you an example, obviously, with the impact that nutrition has. So, you, you're training, you're training consistently, you're training off season, but your abs aren't in because you're carrying extra body weight compared to when you competed. What caused that? Nutrition. To cut up for a show, what caused you to be able to get leaner? Nutrition. And that's what I mean, like it's like my body under the body fat looks the same all year round kind of thing, but the difference is whether I'm eating more or less food. So the training's the constant in that situation, but how my body looks is a direct result of the nutrition. And that's the same for whether you're um, you know, breaking your body down too much, you know, potentially holding back gains or whether you're, you know, overtraining, eating too much and gaining too much in the off season, that is 100% down to the nutrition side of it because I will assume that you are training fairly constantly throughout that cycle and that doesn't change, but what is changing is your nutrition. So to me, the impact of that is um, it's everything. Like it's the, it's the difference between having abs and not having abs or growing or not growing or recovering properly because the training is the constant. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you you treat your nutrition as almost the most important thing. Yes. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Because it's it's you know I'm training the same all the time, but how to, the only way I can change my body really is by um, what's the word for it? Intentionally altering my nutrition. So that's that's as simple as that. So you mentioned um, before that you know you can feel really hungry. You know you mentioned hunger before. Have you ever noticed that um, you did you know you did a mass massive workout one day and then and you were next day of course you're, you're just feeling really depleted and hungry like how, how do you combat that and why might that be happening is it again you're just putting the wrong fuel into your system yeah so legs day is probably a really good example for that yeah. where it um you know from a calorie burning point of view and also people underestimate the the calorie burning effect of stress so obviously when you're doing a heavy weight session you're also putting your body under a massive amount of stress so the cortisol is being released and that in itself requires a, um, a degree of recovery, like mental, you know, your brain burns calories as well. So the mental stress and the, and the mental concentration that's going into that workout. So when, um, when you're prepping for a show, some people will put more calories on legs day to kind of counteract that. Me, that was the day that actually was how I got my weight to shift down. <laughs> if I didn't beat my body up and if I didn't push really hard, I would find that my body was so good at recovering because everything was so taken care of that I really needed to have that heavy impact and that that type of a workout. So it is it is definitely um, if you're again if you're not putting the right fuel in to match up what you've done, then you will feel that the next day. Like you because it's it's like it it may even not impact you. Even that that pre workout meal is still a continuation of like if you didn't get it right the day before, then what you do right then that day isn't necessarily going to be enough. To help you on that day everything is like a continuum like there's nothing happens in isolation what you're doing now is impacting tomorrow you know what you do after your workout is impacting tomorrow so everything is directly related back to that so a lot of the reason why you're feeling that extra depleted is that you've potentially um, stressed your body a lot more and not taking care of that recovery so it does take that extra period of time um, I know and again I'll, I'll reference back to something that Brandon does he will take the day off either before or after a legs day because he says he's that physically taxed from it that there's no point in trying to do another workout like even with the best recovery even with the right timing the right supplements his body needs that extra time to recover and that's the other thing that people need to take into consideration is when to take the rest days 
and that that's another part of the equation that people don't talk about a lot the rest day uh and when to time that and and um you know how to eat on those rest days. how to eat on those rest days exactly because you're not necessarily oh i'm not training i can't eat anything like um that is you know that is when your body is really getting that good recovery and because as i said the body will always try to do that and it might just take a longer time period because of what you've done so you imagine it you've kind of like depleted it and sucked it down to a level which is quite low it's going to come back up to here maybe from one day with the normal feeding and again you can't especially when you're prepping for a show you can't eat ad lib and when i say ad lib pretty much means whatever you like when you're still trying to control your calories in that way then it may take that extra period of time to bounce you back up to where you need to be so there's a, again it's that difference between when you have the luxury of being able to just eat freely and when you when you have to have that discipline of still controlling what you're eating but um yeah there's nothing happens in isolation like everything is always like this this huge continuum because you've got a storage reserve and you'll deplete that and you have to like replenish it and your body's always trying to store like it's first thing is to like okay let's put back let's put back what we had so you know if and that's the thing with um cardio and stuff like that if you're doing very high intensity cardio again that puts you into a very very um you know large deficit of what you need so the, the how you've how you kind of body deals with that is it's like it's taking that whole day everything's going to storage to replenish first and then there's nothing left over to store as body fat whereas you might at a a lower intensity burn more direct body fat but you don't burn the same number of calories so your body doesn't need as much to kind of replenish so whilst you might at a high intensity burn more carbohydrate your body kind of has to take from like if you're not feeding it as much carbohydrate too then it will start to pull from body fat to turn into carbs to replenish that so body is very smart it knows exactly what it needs to do to um to re- recover what it needs to um but you can help it by feeding it the right things or you can i guess you know force it and stress it to make it harder to do those things so on a rest day should yeah. we continue with the supplements as per usual um not slightly the, different slightly different yeah. yeah slightly different so a pre-workout obviously is and i'm not talking about your pre-workout meal i'm talking about the actual pre-workout which is designed to like pep you up and pump you up and and you know make you mentally more you know ready to focus and all that kind of stuff probably not a good idea to take that because you don't have an outlet for it unless you're i don't know going to play with your kids or something and you feel like you need a bit of a zip up to do that but um there's um i've, I've approached it in two different ways um, over the years and sometimes I have absolutely not changed my nutrition on the rest day um, being that I felt that I was at a point where I needed to get as much recovery as possible in which case I would keep those calories exactly the same um, there's been other times when I've had to push it and um, as I say with bodybuilding it's not always about what's best for your health as much as it's what you best to try to get a look that you're trying to get so you sometimes have to make I guess decisions about am I going to do that or am I going to be absolutely just focusing on health um I'm focusing on a look for bodybuilding I want to be the leanest so therefore I am going to maybe like drop my calories on that day so what I would normally do is I'd modify what would normally have been my pre-workout meal um to reduce um potentially just the calorie input from that because i don't need as much because i'm not burning as much and it's not as critical so i have done it both ways and it's really dependent on where i've been in a diet and, and how how much i need to push at a certain period of time so if you're off season and you're just training away i would certainly just you know probably drop out your pre-workout keep everything else the same any you know anything that you feel is directly related to the performance of your workout then um that's the one that you kind of don't need to have because you don't really need to keep on drinking extra amino recovery when you're not doing anything anything to recover from but as i said that's normally a fairly um a fairly low calorie or low impact type of thing or you might drop out that what would normally have been your post-workout meal because you haven't done a workout so you can kind of drop that extra protein out of that particular one on your rest day but it really depends on what you're trying to do and if you're trying to push your weight up and you're trying to do it off season i would probably keep it exactly the same just minus the the, the mind the mind boosting supplements Mm, fascinating stuff so obviously there's a lot of people out there that really want to drop their body fat what are your uh, most effective techniques for that okay so it's always going to be a combination of the diet and cardio so normal so fasting doesn't come into that fa- yeah, d- define fasting like define what you mean by fasting oh what intermittent fasting we're talking what 16 hours no eating in the end 16 no. 
No. So, like, the way that I look at it is uh, fasting is pretty much the time that you're asleep or, um, you know, probably no more than about 12 hours. So if you look at from the time that you have your first meal to the time that you have your last meal, um, I would, you know, normally would think you would stretch that over somewhere between a 12 to 16 hour period, depending on who you are and what you're doing. So if that's what, if that's not really fasting, um, so yeah, so I don't know that um, in a high performance sport type of thing that that really has a, a really good role because it is about trying to give that consistent delivery of nutrients and that kind of thing. So. I would look at a time frame of that, say, 12, 12 hours. Um, what I would normally do is um, look at how many times I want to eat in that space of time. So I might be a five meal a day kind of person. Um, a lot of bodybuilders are six. Some people are four who I guess are, are not heavily into their weight training, but I would highly recommend that people try to get up to five meals a day. Um, so, that's, so that's number one thing. Spread your meals evenly over a time period. Don't try to bunch them all up into a small period of time. If you're fasting for 16 hours, that means you're trying to block everything into an eight hour period so it probably means you need to have a 16 hour fast to actually deal with that but that's not a really great thing to do um i will say though as i've gotten older i do find that um having like a longer period of time between when i wake up and when i first eat seems to sit better with me so i know like what i did at 20 is totally different to what i'm doing as i head towards 50 it's body does change body does slow down in, in how it deals with things um, but let's say we're talking about the average sort of, you know, 30 year old who's, you know, 30 to 40 year old who's like heavy into their weight training or, or heavy into their gym or sport or anything like that, then um, I don't see that there'd be a huge benefit to trying to like compact everything into a small eight hour period. It's all about that delivery of nutrients over a constant period of time. And again, I know bodybuilders who get up and eat throughout the night. So they actually eat over a 24 hour period spaced out evenly and they oh, just wow. kind of like I, I call the day just like totally cycles around um i'm and you know there is some research around um you know feeding your body like that and also then the impact on how you release growth hormone and all kinds of things like that but that to me was like just one step too far from how far i was going to put to commit because i still had to work and wake up and i you know i think a, a full solid you know s you know six to eight hours of sleep is a lot better than broken bits of, of four hours here and there. Um, so if you're not doing, I guess, a full-time job, that might work for you. But if you have to get up and go to work and deal with things, you know, for 10 or, or so hour period at work, then I would recommend that you don't try to mess around with waking up during the night to make sure you space out your, your food. If you're just trying to lose body fat, bring that back to that sort of 12 hour period, work out how many meals you want to have, and then work out a relatively even spacing within that. So that's the first thing that you would do then you maybe look at still having you know three of those meals slightly larger than the other two but try to make really those five meals very very consistently like um consistent energy delivery so the calories are like nearly the same within a couple hundred calories you might have like um say you say you're going to have two thousand calories spread over those five meals that's average of 400 calories per meal so you might have a couple that have got 500 and a couple that have got 300 ones that got 400 but you're not going like one that has 800 and one that has 200 so i'm talking about balance throughout that day so that's kind of how you make the, the framework of your diet and then you need to work out what is enough calories that you're going to actually lose body fat so there is no simple let's just drop out all of our carbs or let's just do this or you know something really simple because that is that is not to me it's not scientific it's not needed it, it doesn't give you the best performance like it's all about having that balance carbs certainly get that kind of stigma around them, don't they? they do and i and i say it's like the lazy person's way of dieting because you don't have to think you just go oh, i'll just drop out carbs and you don't, you don't have to plan anything and to me successful dieting is so much about planning i say it's actually the mass of nutrition like it is so mathematical which probably like scares a lot of people but if you want to do it properly you nearly you you have to know your numbers you have to know your calories and, I'm, and i say calories because Whoever thought of turning it to kilojoules was just nasty because who can who can add up those kind of numbers in their head? We can all add up 100 calories, 50 calories, 200 calories. You can work that out very, very easily. You start working in numbers up in the thousand that's like, you know, 587 kilojoules and, you know, 1,250. It's, it's a lot more difficult, so people don't tend to stick to it. But if you're talking about, okay, 400 calories a meal, it's very, very easy to work those things out. And, and to me, that's half of it, just kind of taking that time to work out what you need. Um, but if, you just, if you're looking for a lazy way of doing it, of course, if you drop out an entire 
food group, like and you drop out all of your carbs and just limit it to eating protein and fats, it's by just by the the the, the whole way that you'll naturally tend to eat um you'll have a better chance of losing weight but then it's not necessarily guaranteed because you are eating protein and fat and it's very easy to overeat fats so it's not a really great way of doing it like it's not a guarantee just because you cut out carbs that you're going to drop weight because you because your calories still has to count like your overall calorie intake is still what is going to determine whether you're going to lose that body fat or not so that's why um, you know carbs get that bad rap because people think oh it straight away converts to body fat and this that and the other. It's only because it's easy to eat too much of them. You know if you're eating if you're portion controlling and eating the right amount of carbs, they give you so much energy. In fact, they give you more energy to burn more energy. Um, and um, that's you know that's one thing where I had an experience with a competition one time where I had to you know, make a weight class. And um, I was I was struggling because I was literally down to just losing muscle, like I had lost all the body fat. And um, I ended up going to a dietitian to get some help because I was like, I, I don't even know if this is possible to do what I want to do. And um, she said, just trust me on this. We're going to increase your calories overall. And um, I'm like, Ooh, okay. So, you know, we actually added in dairy product, believe it or not, because she said my diet, the only thing that was missing was vitamin B2. She said, you need to get that from your dairy. So we added that in. Straight away, my strength went back up at the gym. <laughs> I actually ended up in a situation where I was getting hypoglycemia because it was like as soon as my body was able, it went in and it pushed harder and then I burnt more calories and then it like dropped me back down again. So it was kind of like I put these calories up and then my weight started plummeting down because it was able to actually like do more. And, and that's the thing with dropping out carbohydrates is people lose their energy. They get dieters brain you know your brain has to run off carbohydrate and people get forgetful and i see that um it impacts their work and to me you know it's all great to be all fit and healthy and all that kind of stuff but if you can't function as a normal human being and you can't hold down a job or pay your bills or remember to go to appointments and, and or even you know i know so many people who've crashed cars um getting ready for competition because they just haven't been concentrating and that's all through that you know lack of carbohydrate so performance to me and and even like your actual weight session is driven by the carbs like you're you're running off carbohydrate so you know you need to you need to have those carbs there to have the very best workouts um, and that's without going into the texture of the muscle and how how people who tend to do low carb dieting tend to get like a softer look on their muscle because it doesn't have the glycogen in it and doesn't have the ability to work as hard as a, a muscle that has carbohydrate in it and you tend to get like a sort of a slightly spongy look um so it's, it's just wrong for bodybuilding in all kind of ways but um yeah just simply doing that is not the way to lose body fat it really is to look at your diet bring it down so you're in a, a calorie deficit and then make it as easy as possible for yourself by giving you that constant delivery of food and then as far as how you personally decide to break up your macros that's a that's a whole other three hours that i can talk about <laughs> doing that she's a good talker isn't she hey, um, tell us what your meal plan looks like during the day what, what, what okay. do you eat okay so my meal my meal plan right now is kind of structured off my bodybuilding meal plan uh, i'll probably never ever go away from that um so essentially the you know my morning meal it's and i actually can't tell you exactly what it is because i worked it out about two years ago and then just forgot about it and that's actually how i dieted i would set my meal plan at a diet and i would only really look at it when i had to adjust something and i have to like flick open my little spreadsheet and look at what it was and manipulate it and then i would set it and off i would go so i can't tell you exactly how many grams of anything that i'm eating at the moment because i've just been doing it and it's working for me so so you've got a spreadsheet system to be able to work this out which you've got a template that i'm yeah. sure a lot of people would love to potentially use yes well that thing people use things like fitness pal and all that kind of stuff but um i I have, to, I, I have to know the numbers that I've been put into it. Like, I don't, I, as I said, I haven't kind of played with that and I haven't looked at the numbers in the background, but I'll do a little bit on my spreadsheet. Where, where has my spreadsheet come from? Okay, when I was in my first year of uni, my friend's mum worked at a government printing agency and they, I don't know what they did, but she somehow got her hands on a copy of the Australian Nutritional Tables. This book was... It's over, I don't know, a thousand pages and it's like every single food that exists in Australia has been tested nutritionally. So it has like the protein, the fat, the carb, the fiber, the sugars, everything in this table. And I manually input it into my spreadsheet, anything that interested me. So 
whether it be chicken breast or rice, all those kind of things. Then I've added myself any what I call commercial food, which is a packaged food, which has a nutritional table on it. So a lot of the things obviously like fruit and vegetables, you don't get, you know, it doesn't come in the supermarket with a nutritional table on it. Um, so those generic kind of foods um, I took out of these tables. But obviously now like every everything from rice to pretty much everything except, you know, salad and fruit and vegetables has a nutritional panel on it. So anything that I've eaten, I've basically input into this spreadsheet. And so that's what I say. So I can see what's gone in there. I don't like I, I did a Google search on, um, you know, the other day because one of my reps wanted to do a comparison between, um, you know, different foods and protein and look at the price of them and, and the nutritional thing. And I was just like I always like to kind of, I guess, cross reference what people are looking at and what is fact and everything. And I, I think I come up with like 10 different results for different foods. And I know from these nutritional tables because these are being like actually tested in laboratories how much protein I'm expecting to see in chicken breast and how much protein I'm expecting to see in a, a certain type of meat or something. And the numbers that were coming up on this Google search were like very scary. And then her numbers were very odd. And she goes, oh, I've got them out of fitness pal. So as I said, I don't trust anything that I haven't seen what what um, what data has been put into the background of it. And I don't know whether you have the ability to then manipulate it yourself. So I'm old fashioned. I like a spreadsheet. I can see everything. I can see the impact of what I'm changing. So essentially I set my spreadsheet up by meal. So each meal is like a subgroup. So I can look at all my all my um, fat, protein and carbs and, and fiber and salts, what's coming in from a meal. And then I can see my whole day. So like each meal is a sub block and then overall, what does that give me for my day? Like, cause, I'm, cause I will have some meals where my protein will be a little bit lower and my carb will be higher. I don't try to get the exact same ratio at every single meal. I look at the overall day, but I don't try to be too far off either. Like I don't have a meal where I have like zero protein and just all carbs. Like I, I don't have one of those. Everything is a balance of those nutrients. Um, so yeah, so that's my my spreadsheet, and that's so. So I'm putting you on the spot here. Yeah. But is that is there an opportunity that we actually put this spreadsheet online where people can get access to your secret sauce? I mean, you yeah. are a three times world champion, so this has got to be some really really. Uh, you know, good information for some aspiring bodybuilders. Yeah, I, I think we could, and I think we could. What would be most important is we would teach people how to input the foods that they use themselves. Yeah. Um, because it, it, like, for example, you know, we we have those little flavored rice cake things there. I would input that as one unit. I wouldn't do it per hundred grams. So obviously, certain foods you would do per hundred grams, and other foods you would do per serving like a tub of yogurt you're not going to eat half a tub of yogurt and it might be 140 grams so you put in the values for that one tub so i think what we would what would be kind of cool to do would be to actually do a um i don't know whether a webinar or something but actually teach people how to input their own values into the spreadsheet give them the template of how to load their foods and, and have all the calculations in there yeah that'd be well, I think, that'd be cool i think After, our listeners are going to really appreciate that and if they can jump onto our website and then download that yep. spreadsheet see how to do it and that would be absolute gold for a lot of people yeah i mean that's what i didn't i haven't prepped a lot of people over the years but i always use that and i always i have a little thing where i take it like so if a protein sorry if something like rice is obviously has a protein content i actually don't count that as protein i push that into my into my carbohydrate count because in that instance it's not like if, if it doesn't have the right pairing of protein it's not going to get used as protein so it's almost like it may or it may not so if in doubt only trust the protein which is you know guaranteed going to have all of the amino acids that you need so that's just a uh, um you're getting complicated yeah, i'm getting very complicated you got no idea what i'm talking she about there but look on my face <laughs> and you know <laughs> anyway. oh there's so much to learn there's so much to teach there is, there um, is but there yeah is. but the spreadsheet is as i said it's a set and forget system and when i prep people i would then translate that into a language that they could understand i wouldn't give them the spreadsheet because Sorry, I, I would give them the spreadsheet so they could see if they wanted to, but I would essentially say, take what I had input and then turn that into a diet where all they were seeing was like, um, you know, 30 grams of Synergy and, you know, 200 gram of yogurt or one apple or something which is in a language that they would understand uh, and then just give them like a breakdown of, okay, this is giving you X calories, X grams of protein, which is X percentage protein in your diet. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't dump that on somebody or I was... I always use that in the background um, and then just kind of spat them out a diet that was user friendly at the other end of it. But um, but, so, but just coming back to my diet and what I'm doing now, 
Um, as I said, protein, fat, carbs. So breakfast is essentially cereal, and everyone thinks that's a dirty word. Um, so many people like oats is cool if you live in Melbourne, you know, or if you want to do a, an overnight porridge or something like that and eat it cold. But in Queensland, let's face it, it's too hot to eat hot food. So I will. I'm doing at the moment some kind of um, some kind of cereal that's I can't even think of the name of it, but it's yeah, it's essentially I do try to look for low sugars because obviously cereal, commercial cereal is generally like very high in sugar, and that's obviously why oats are very popular because they're you know pretty much carbohydrate. Um, and then I always have protein powder with that. Sometimes I'll have yogurt and oats and protein powder, but there's always that's one of my meals where I'll take protein powder because I do not want to eat chicken first thing in the morning. I don't want to eat fish. I don't want to eat steak and I don't want to eat eggs. So the only option left to me is protein powder and there isn't enough protein in milk to count to be able to use that as a, as a you know, a protein source. Like it can addish, be an addition, but it's not going to be enough. You have to drink too much of that stuff to get what you want in terms of a protein count with you know three percent three or three and a half percent protein it's a lot of you might have to eat like drink like a liter to get to get what you need you know i don't want to drink a liter of milk so i don't really count that so that's my my um, i call it meal one even though it's breakfast and it's done after you know my, my cardio workout um then my next meal and my second and my third meal right now are exactly the same that brown rice and chicken um so the amount of rice and the amount of chicken that I eat is predetermined off what I worked out two years ago. Um, and then my next meal is my pre-workout meal normally um, if we were going to the gyms after work. And that is normally consisting of now that they have that high protein um, yogurt that's made with stevia or something, so it's got no sugar. Um, I can't even think of the name of it now. There's two different brands that basically have the same kind of product. So it's got about 15 grams of protein in a serving of the yoga. I just have that and some fruit at the moment. If I was competing and all that, I definitely would be eating more protein at that meal. I would definitely be souping that up because to me, 15 grams isn't enough um, if I'm gonna do a, a heavy session. But right now, it's that's quite fine. And then after I've, and then I'll, so in the morning I have some amino recovery and some your carny strip and then I have my health drink with my glutamine and um, gosh, what else is in there? There's like maca and, um, kombucha powder and turmeric and um you know psyllium fiber and apple cider vinegar and just all these crazy wow, things that so go healthy. into my health yeah. drink that's brilliant <laughs> yeah so, so that's in the morning and because i'm doing most of my high intensity workouts in the morning i am having that amino recovery before and after my high intensity workout because then i'm it takes me a long time to then eat breakfast because i've got to have a shower and I sometimes have a you know meeting back to Canada with one of our clients and so from waking up at like quarter to four I'm sometimes not eating breakfast till like seven or eight in the morning so I need to have that amino recovery just to get that little bit of protein into me at that point there when I'm weight training at night then there would be like a, a post I'd have the amino recovery post workout because I'm then home and I'm probably having dinner within an hour of workout so I'm not bothering with the protein shake at that point and then dinner is um more chicken Salad. I oh, like chicken. Love chicken. I eat chicken all the time. You're not worried about the hormones? No. I think I'm eating organic, possibly hormone free. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So and again, if I'm if I'm in the States, I always have what do they call it? The air chilled hormone hormone free something or other, something or other you can get from Whole Foods. Or now you can get it in most of the supermarkets in America. I haven't seen air chilled over here, but it's definitely more tender than what we buy over here. But I am definitely eating organic. Um whether like in Australia I don't know that the hormone thing is such an issue because we do have very strict guidelines around what animals are fed and I think we do kind of we get a little bit hyped up about what we hear in America because for example um, a lot of their meat and stuff might come over from Mexico where there's no control and then before you know it it's like they, they don't know what they're eating whereas Australia is like it's it is really like super controlled and, and super um concerned with those kind of things so i believe that even just the regular chicken here is probably not going to be too much of an issue but if, it, if organic's available i'd rather you know eat that where i believe that the chicken has had a better life a bit, bit, bit more freedom um but uh, but yeah so the dinner is like i eat more things like um you know kale shredded up kale and just you know broccoli and all the usual kind of vegetables that bodybuilders eat and um i'll jazz that up by putting some hummus or like some kind of dip or something as a sauce like mix that all together as a salad dressing which is just for taste yeah cool. so but very simple so okay there was a lot of food there what do you do you have sort of set 
times that you eat? You pretty much, yeah. I try to stick to set times. As I said, morning can be a little bit anywhere between like seven and eight, depending on if I've managed to eat breakfast before the phone call or I've had to wait till afterwards or something like that. But, you know, that's within that time period. Then I try to eat around about 11 and then two and then somewhere between four and five for the the pre-workout one. And then obviously dinner would be around sort of eight to nine. Yeah. Okay. Now, final question. If someone wants to drop their body fat from 15% to, let's say, I don't know, 8%, what, what would a good piece of advice be? Oh, the, Just because that's yeah. a hot topic. That's yeah. always a hot topic. Yeah. I, I mean, obviously, where do I start? Because obviously if you you have something very specific in mind, like that type of percentage, because that's a pretty large percentage when you think about it, I would get my... Well, it's a journey, isn't it? It, it's it's a long journey and I would probably say firstly give yourself plenty of time for that one because um, you know as a percentage wise you know that could be a th- good three month period like don't think you're going to do that in like a month like that's definitely going to be a long term commitment that you're going to make nowadays with all of the technology around that I would say get a body scan done um, see where you're at um, that'll you know I guess that'll kind of tell you starting point from there I would then use exactly the structure that we talked about, which was, you know, figuring out how many meals you want to eat in that day and like basically working out the framework of your diet. But um, this is just a thing and this is I talk about commitment because if you really want a good result, you have to put the work in. It's not going to happen by chance. So number two, I guess, is go by yourself instead of kitchen scales because you're going to have to weigh some food at some point in time because you cannot guess. And I'll tell you what, when you do try to guess and you're hungry, you'll be surprised what you can make that measure or what you can make that amount look like. Um, For example, before I had kitchen scales, I had a glass that had lines on it. So I would, I knew that like up to that particular line was where my oats was what I was allowed to have. And as I got hungrier, I found that if I like went down and like put the glass kind of like at eye level, I could actually get more in and it would still be at that line, (laughs) what I was seeing. Well, you've got so, two brains, don't you? You've got one in your head, you've got one in your stomach, and in fact, males probably have three. But, but you know, like the stomach takes over, doesn't it? It, it does. So you, it tricks you. And that's when I realised that it had to be an absolute number. Like, you know, and, and you can't put your little, like, finger on the scale and make it lighter or something. So be, like, basically what it is is being honest with yourself. Like, what's the point in cheating yourself? Like, really, who, who like, nobody else is the one that wants to lose the weight. So don't bullshit yourself, really. You know, so, so I would say to make it easier on yourself, you do, you're going to have to measure something at some point in time. So that you know that would be one of my things. So give yourself plenty of time, work out a really good structure. Now, the hardest part of all of this is how do you know what on earth to cut your food back to? Okay, how do you know how to do that? So you're actually going to have to keep a food diary and do some calculations. Like you, like if you've been eating a certain thing. You've been um, your weight's been constant, so let's assume that you haven't been gaining weight. You've just been constant, constant, constant at that fifteen percent body fat. Now you want to bring it down, so you need to keep a food diary and actually calculate what you've been eating. So that's the that's the most accurate method. Um, otherwise, what you and, need to do and do you track it along the way? Like a, you know, you've got one of those giant old school calendars on the wall when you put a cross on it. Uh, no, no, th- no. This is a very specific thing. This is this is your what you need to do before you start on your journey to, okay. to drop this yep. weight. So this is the week. So let's say this is the week before you plan to start your diet. Yep. Well, give yourself two weeks because it might take you a long time with the calculations. But essentially, every day, write down what you're eating on a daily basis. Okay, plug it into my spreadsheet. Plug in food. Okay, it spits out. Okay, today you ate two thousand two hundred calories. This, it was this much protein, this much fat, this much carbs. Tomorrow you plug it in and it was 1,900 calories. And then the next day you plug it in and you ate 2,800 calories. So you're basically working out your daily calorie over a week's period. Get to the end of the week, assuming your weight hasn't changed in that week, divide it by seven and get your average daily calorie intake. So if that's what you've maintained on, so say the average comes out at 2,000, to start your diet, drop it to about 1,700. Don't drop it to 1,000, don't drop it to 1,950. It has to be something significant. Um, if you found out that your average was 2,500 and you want to go a little bit quicker, maybe drop it to 2,000, like drop that sort of 500. But somewhere between 300 and 500 calorie deficit to start off your diet is probably where you need to be. So to me, 
that's the most accurate way of doing it. And when I did prep people, I always made people write down for like, I needed their food diary for a week to start so I could work out where they were at. It also showed me if they had a pattern, like it showed me um, where their natural eating patterns were or if they were just like so random. And then I knew they were going to have more trouble following a routine versus whether or not they would be, oh, this, this person's going to be easy. They're already eating a routine. If you don't have the patience to do all that, you need to just put a, a stake in the sand and start and you need to just set yourself up a diet, but you have to be prepared that you're going to have to adjust probably more quickly than the person who took the trouble to work it out. So your your journey might get off to a, a slower start in that you might pick what you think you've been eating. Okay, I think I've been eating um, 2,500 calories. I think I'm going to start on 2,000 and you might set your diet out at 2,000 and you might realise that nothing happened because you, like, you overestimated what you were eating. So that first week is kind of like nothing happens so, but then you have a baseline and then from there you can adjust and, and go from there or you might find heaven forbid you gained weight that first week because you underestimated or you know like it, it really um that's the, that's probably like the most simple way for most people is just like put a mark in the sand take a guess and then go from there if you don't want to be bothered writing everything down beforehand but if you have a fairly structured diet that's easy if you have a totally random diet it's probably really hard so you just got to pick a number basically um, but you have to pick a sensible number you know you can't you know my my thing when I was prepping people particularly the women I would never let anyone go under 1300 calories I didn't I didn't care if they were not going to get in shape I would just say don't compete because to me it's not healthy like you if your weight is not dropping at that weight I, I think there's too many other issues that are going to crop up if you start to go too like too much lower than that so for health reasons um, if you're weight training, if you were sedentary, maybe you know 1,200 calories might be as low. Some people seem to like 900 and stuff, but that's I don't know. That must be really, really sedentary, like to be down on that kind of calorie thing. So definitely, um, you know, you got to be mindful. That if if you're working out your diet and you're already on about 2,000 and you're 15% body fat and you want to get down to that 8% body fat, you're going to have to do that over a much longer period of time because you can't really. You know, there's not much room for you to move there. So that's that's the first thing. The second thing is then obviously your cardio. You know, you've got to start some cardio. You can't just do the diet without the cardio. But don't start with everything. Start with the minimum cardio that you think you need to do to give yourself room to move. Because over that progression, you're going to hit so many um, so many stagnant points where you're going to have to push past that. So then you have to either drop your calories some more or increase the cardio. Don't do both at the same time one then the other one then the other and that's the rhythm and then you probably every month get your scan redone so that would be my advice look this is fascinating stuff i'm sure everybody listening has really really enjoyed this uh we try and keep our podcast a little bit shorter but the way i just couldn't stop you it was too good so thank you once again and we'll look forward to our next episode which is also going to be about nutrition cool look it's as I, as I said it's it's each one of these you could really talk about for probably two hours anyhow so if there is anything that people want more detail on we could probably do a, po a podcast on that entire topic yeah so so, so any listeners that uh, want certain questions answered um, fire us an email yeah uh, leave some comments in the bottom of the podcast feed once again thank you very much thanks Ash words of wisdom if you like what you've heard, recognize that these tips, they're free. So show your support by becoming a loyal international protein customer by jumping online, hunt our product down and hit that buy now button. So once again, like, share and subscribe to our podcast so we can continue to bring you these episodes from our one and only Aussie muscle guru, three times world champion, Christine Enville.